Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I'm Stephanie. You have found the dark oak. On today's episode, we discuss the crazy disappearance of the Brown family. The entire Brown family disappeared. Crazy. It is pretty crazy. Welcome to the Dark Oak, the mystery podcast with purpose. Each month through the Branch of Hope Fun, we give a portion of earnings from our Patreon and sponsors to a nonprofit organization of your choosing. To find out how you can be a part of the movement, head over to thedarkoak.com or stay with us until the end of the episode and we'll give you all the Stephanie, you and I have talked about it before, but the cases that baffle me the most are the disappearances. The cases where somebody or somebody's just disappear. Disappear off the face of the off earth. Off the face of the earth. No explanation. Yeah. Those really get to me. So today's case about the entire Brown family going missing is pretty crazy. Okay. I don't find these to the, be the most spooky too. Like, how does that happen? How does that happen? It's very frightening because they they obviously didn't just fall off the face of the earth. But where are they? I remember the point, you know, I just believe there was always an answer to everything. You know, I didn't necessarily know the answer. My parents didn't know the answer, but someone would know the answer. Sure. But to realize we may never know answers to things just blew my mind and... I'm still there. I am still have that that teenage wonder about how how is it possible that we haven't found living people? I mean, or I guess they could be deceased. But the fact of the matter is, I just mean like a whole person. A whole person. How does a whole person just or disappear. persons disappear? Right. And in this case, we have almost a whole family that has b- remained missing for almost 40 years. So let me tell you more. Okay, I I do. And this is not a super common, like covered, a a commonly covered case, right? This is not. So I had to go to uh, several different websites and publications. I listened to another podcast, all of which I'm going to source in our our show notes. And wait, is this like a deep dive? Well, it's as deep dive as I can get when honestly, there's not a whole lot of information out there about this case. Still makes me so proud, Cynthia. (laughs) (laughs) This is a Cynthia version of a deep dive. (laughs) I trust you. (laughs) Okay, we'll see. (laughs) In the summer of 1985, the entire Brown family completely vanished. Now, the Brown family was made up of James Michael Brown, who was 37, his wife, Carolyn, who was 27. And their three children, Shakita Michelle, who was 10, Barry Michael, who was six, and Brandon Mitchell, who was two. They all disappeared from their home in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And at the time of their disappearance, Carolyn and James Brown had been married for 10 years. Wait, I'm doing math in my head. So she's 27 now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right. He's 10 years her senior. He is 10 years her senior. And they have... Three kids. Okay. Three kids. Yep. All right. And kind of little younger. Yeah. Ten, on the six, younger and side. two. And they all just vanished. They just vanished. We will learn a little <sighs> more. So wild. Because one of them does reappear. Okay. At one point during their marriage, James and Carolyn were both teachers with James holding a master's degree in child guidance. James taught social studies at Lincoln Park Middle School and Carolyn worked at Chester A. Moore Elementary School. And Carolyn was known as being such a caring teacher that she would even make occasional home visits to her students, which I was like, that's really sweet. I never had a teacher visit me at home. So the Brown's oldest child, Shakita, was Carolyn's biological daughter from a previous relationship. But given her age, 10, and the timeline of the Brown marriage, again, 10 years, it was clear that Shakita had known James as her father for her entire life. Okay. I don't know if her actual biological father was involved in her life or not. Okay. But whatever it is, since she was a baby, she's known James as her dad. Right. Yes. Two years before the family's disappearance, in 1983, Shakita's teachers reached out to welfare workers because Shakita came to school covered in welts and bruises. Oh, I know. Baby. When questioned, Shakita told authorities that her father, James, 
had beat her with a leather strap for spending 10 cents of her school lunch money on a pencil. Whoa. Okay. It's never okay to leave your kid with welts. However, that seems like an overreaction. For a pencil while she's at school. I mean, I don't know if she needed the pencil. I don't know. But yeah. Okay. Too much. She was put into the temporary care of the State Division of Youth Services, and James ended up pleading no contest to attempted aggravated child abuse, and he was sentenced to three years probation. Obviously and appropriately, his teaching certificate was suspended and he lost his job. Yeah. Yes. Shakita was not the only member of the Brown household to be abused by James, unfortunately. He was also allegedly abusive towards Carolyn, causing her to spend a lot of her free time at their church. So we have a domestic violence situation here right off the bat. Yeah, bad news. Right off the bat. In June of 1984, James began a new job as an interim 4-H agent at St. Lucie County Cultural Extension Office. But the grant for that position only lasted one year. And so when that year ended, he once again found himself unemployed. In April 1985, James applied for and was interviewed for a probation officer position, but he did not get the job. What? Can you imagine this guy as a probation officer? After just getting off probation. After just getting off probation. And I mean, he's and he can't control his anger. Right. Yeah. Not good. Not good at all. In mid-August of that year, 1985, Rosa Walker, Carolyn's mother, right, called the police. She'd become worried about her daughter and her grandchildren after she abruptly stopped hearing from them. Now, Rosa lived about five hours away from the Brown family. So Rosa and Carolyn would talk on the phone at least once a week, just check in. But Rosa said she had not heard from Carolyn or her family since July 4th. So going on a month and a half. Uh, No good. No good. So Rosa asked if officers could check on the Brown family. Sure. And when they first arrived at the Brown home, nothing really seemed completely out of the ordinary. Nobody was home, but it looked at first like maybe the family had just run out to, you know, run an errand or go out for a bit, definitely plan to return. But closer examination of the house disclosed some pretty alarming things. Uh Uh-oh. A carton of milk was left on the counter and there was a rotten meal set at the dining table. It looked as if someone had taken it out, planning to eat it but then just walked away and left, never came back. And rotting, meaning it had been there for a while. Rotting. So it wasn't like somebody had set it out that morning and then ran out. No. It had been there a week, maybe more. Okay. Maybe more. A light was left on in the bathroom. The garage door handle was in the open position, and the thermostat was set to 75. Now, this is August in Florida. For me, mine never goes above 70, but, you know, I don't know. We each like our own. I like the warm stuff, Cynthia. Mine's like 78. Wow. Wow. I I would be dead. I like it a little balmy. A little. (laughs) The closets were still full of clothing. It didn't appear that anything was missing. Carolyn's purse and glasses were found inside the garage. And inside her purse was her ID, which had been cut up. Okay, weird. Weird, right? Yeah. One of the rooms in the house. It, but it was back. So somebody cut it and it went back into back the Back in our purse. Which okay, was definitely in the weird. corner in a garage. That's not great. Weird. One of the rooms in the house had been freshly painted. And though police did not know it at the time, they would later find out that this fresh coat of paint was covering up blood stains. Red flag. Red flag. A receipt dated June 21st for a semi-automatic pistol was found, but the gun was not found in the house. Okay. The Brown family owned two cars, and one of them was still at a local repair shop where it had been since July. But the other family vehicle, a 1981 Buick Skylark, was missing. Sadly, the family's pet hamster was in his cage, dead, appearing to have thirsted or starved to death. Yeah. Okay, so that's horrible. Horrible. And also indicative of the fact that no one has been in the home for quite a while. Right. And to me, it appears that this departure 
was not planned. Was not planned. Right. It wasn't like they were going on a trip. They had a house sitter. They had. Right. Right. Okay. When asked, neighbors told authorities that they had begun to notice that the grass was overgrown and they had not seen the kids outside playing for a while. Police held a press conference on August 16th announcing that the Brown family was missing. But despite all of these weird scenarios inside the home, the police did not feel like they had enough to say that the disappearance of the family was the result of foul play. Well, okay. What more would they need? Well, they really didn't have anything. And, and at this point, they didn't realize the paint was covering the blood, right? They did right? not, no. Okay, so that's, okay. So they I'm have, like, but then I remember you said they would later they figure later out. later find that out, but at this time, they don't know Okay, that. so what do they have? They have a deceased hamster. They have a meal that had been left on the counter a while. They had a cut-up card and a purse hidden in the garage. They had a freshly painted room, but no indication it was covering anything up. So yeah, okay. I mean... It was weird, but it wasn't like they they didn't really have anything, to be honest. They didn't have anything. They had no clue. They had no idea where to even start. Yeah, it's true. Where do you even go to look? Right. Right. Well, one of the ideas they had is that maybe James and Carolyn had either left their house together or perhaps the couple had even decided to go separate ways and just not told anyone of their plans. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure stranger things have happen well obviously that's why we have this right. podcast however yeah i mean i can see they're they were two adults they've got children yeah right authorities admitted that the scenario in which the house was left and the fact that carolyn had not had any contact with her mother or anyone else was definitely strange but again it was all they had and this was during the summer so no one would know if she wasn't at work Right, right, right. Okay, because I'm like, wait, nobody noticed her at work. I'm like, yeah, but it's the summer it's and she's a summer. teacher she's and a he's unemployed. You got it. The kids are not in school. The kids are not. Oh. All right. So your, bra- your okay, brain's working. So that is suspicious. Very, yes. So the police announced that they would continue to pursue leads as they became available. But again, as of that August 16th press conference, there was nothing going on. However, at least here in Florida, which is where this case takes place, when does school start? Oh, in August. August. Yeah. So the heat's going to start ramping up real quick, right? You got it. So Carolyn was actually scheduled to report back to the school after summer break in just two days. And her kids, too. Her kids, too. Well, she had to go in a little earlier well, not the for baby. school. You're, oh, right, because she's got to so set up her classroom. Right. right. So she's scheduled to return back to work on August 18th, two days from this press conference. Right. She's going to go set up her classroom. And then a week after that, her kids are going to be in school. In. Oh, okay. Yeah. So things are about to get weird. Right. And the police knew that. So they said if Carolyn does not show up for work as scheduled, that's going to change things yeah, regarding this investigation of course that'll be an indicator something might be wrong who knows maybe they just were like you know what let's do an extended family vacation in the mountains let's go to the beach you know and they just ran out they forgot the hamster who knows right Right. police said we'll respond accordingly i would never have forgotten the hamster how could anybody forget the hamster no hamster guys no hamsters left behind you it's our new motto absolutely (laughs) that and uh you know the bell witch um, I I was once happy, but I have been disturbed. If you don't know what we're talking about, folks, you got to listen to the <laughs> Bell Witch episode because truer words have never been spoken. I was once happy, and now I've been disturbed. Also, hashtag no hamsters left behind. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> well, can you guess whether or not Carolyn returned to work on the 18th? Well, the fact that we're talking about this case probably indicates nah. She didn't. And so the family was officially reported missing. Now, shortly after... The official missing persons report was filed. Carolyn's sister received a phone call from James, and he was calling from a Jacksonville, Florida hotel. During this call, he told her she could have anything she wanted from inside the Brown family home. And she said, no, thank you. (laughs) Where's my sister? Uh, No, thanks. Also, where are you? Right. And again, Carolyn's sister, that's all she cared about. She was just worried about the family. She wanted to know about the whereabouts of her sister and her niece and nephews. She wanted wanted to know that everybody was safe. But James was unable to provide her with any answers to these questions and simply told her that his wife and children were out there. Those were the words he used. Ooh, that's haunting. Haunting? It's scary. What would you think? 
out there. Out there. Ew. I don't even know what I would think. I literally just got chills. Yeah. That is not what you want to hear. No. A female friend also came forward saying that James called her to explain that he'd gotten a job and was going to be working out of the country and that he'd taken his two sons, Barry and Brandon, with him. But again, he was unable to give a good answer as to where Carolyn and Shakita were. Okay. These two calls were the only clues that authorities had as to where the Brown family might be. And they came in so abruptly and quickly and weren't expecting it. So like they can trace the call. Was that even a thing back I, then? I mean, in nothing the 80s? was mentioned. I don't know if that's a thing. I mean, he did say he was in a Jacksonville, Florida hotel. So I don't know if they traced it to that or that's where he said he was. Yeah. But Jacksonville, no. well, Jacksonville, as you know, it's it's Florida's biggest mm-hmm. city. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot of places. Right. Now, the Browns had been renting their house for four years. And during that time, they'd always paid their rent on time. They kept the house very neat and clean. But during this month and a half, since anyone had spoken to them or seen them, their lease expired. And so the company that handled the rental had no choice but to evict the family for failure to pay rent. And their mail was forwarded to Carolyn's mother's house. What did they do with all their stuff? I assume it just went to storage. I do know at some point they discovered that that freshly painted room was covering up some bloodstains, which would have been horrifying. Very scary. On August 21st, the Port St. Lucie police held a second police conference in which they said they were cutting back on the investigation until they got solid leads. What else are they expecting to happen? Well, I don't know, but like they have nothing. I, well, trying to find James. Now, again, they're assuming James was James uh, yes. at this point. They think James was him, but also his weird answers they're out there. They're out there. Was this like some alien abduction or something? I mean, it that might be what happened. We oh, really don't my know. Gosh. Two days later, on August 23rd, police announced that the missing Buick Skylark had been found in a parking lot in Savannah, Georgia. Whoa, okay. Which, that's not near. Savannah's like, what, from Jacksonville, if that's real, really where he was. What is that, four hours, five hours? I think it's about that's six probably hours about right. from where we yeah. are, Central Florida. Yeah. The car had been noticed by employees at a nearby store who called the police because the car had no tags and the keys were still in the ignition. Inside the car, there was about $30 cash kept in the glove compartment, a Bible, some white T-shirts, a tennis racket and tennis balls, <laughs> which made me think of you and your kids because they're avid tennis players. It, I mean, it it does describe actually a lot of what would be in our, <laughs> our car. I've got an extra change of clothes because. You just never know. You never know. Um, a random tennis racket and some balls because, you know, my kids always need to do something active. Um, yes. And hitting tennis balls is better than trying to wrestle each other to the ground constantly. Maybe I should get some tennis balls because <laughs> at our house, it's n- normally wrestling that keeps them physically active. Yeah. Well, you could try it. But there's another level of devastation that comes with tennis rackets, too. I can imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. The trunk on this vehicle had also been pried open. Oh. Now, the state of this car was pretty unusual because if the car had been stolen, it really didn't make a whole lot of sense that there would be money left behind, even though it's just $30. If you're going to steal a car, you're, you're going to take anything of any value. Police also found it highly unusual that the car had been abandoned in such a well-populated area. How weird is it, too, that the trunk was pried open, but the keys were in the car? I know. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And they did say that, that the trunk being pried open appeared to be fresh. Because I thought, oh, maybe like the trunk, I don't know, was damaged from a fender bender. But again, the keys are right there. The keys are right there. So that was a dumb criminal if that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> but we know they always exist. So Very strange. Also, mm-hmm. how hard is it to pry a trunk open? I don't know. I would assume kind of hard. I would I assume hard. Tried. I've never tried. <laughs> I guess if you're determined, then I don't know. Again, but then you would have had to assume there was something really valuable in the trunk. Right. And again, no matter what was happening, this was a very well populated area. And that was one of the things that stood out to the police because most stolen cars are left in remote areas. True. So So you're like slamming away at the trunk in this like well populated area. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If the trunk was indeed pried open in this area, I mean, it could have been driven to the area later. True. But that would have been weird with your like trunk like popping open. I don't know. It's totally weird. The whole thing is weird. 
On September 10th, the Savannah police notified Port St. Lucie authorities that James Brown had filed a police report with them on July 18th, saying that he was shot during an alleged robbery. Let me say that again. July 18th, 11 days after Rosa last heard from her daughter, James Brown is filing a police report saying that he'd been shot during an alleged robbery. Uh, okay. He checked into a Savannah, Georgia hospital using the name Demetrius Jones, and he told officials that he'd been hitchhiking through the city when he was shot once behind the left ear. It was a minor injury, and he was only hospitalized for two days. Now, soon after, a worker from a public shelter in Savannah, Georgia, called the police when she saw James Brown's photo in a newspaper article about the missing family, and she recognized James as one of the men staying at the shelter where she worked. This is why it's so important, in my opinion, that like agencies from across, across the country and different jurisdictions work together, because here in Florida, we're into September. And we're still looking for this Brown family. And meanwhile, the next state up, Georgia, James is right there 11 days after they went, were last seen, you know, before they've even been reported missing. I don't understand why law enforcement doesn't share files. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I feel like they might get a little bit of a pass. I mean, 11 days. Are the kids with him? No. Okay. Because he had kind of made that comment that the boys were with him. So I'm trying to be hopeful that like no. something good is going to come out of this. But no, it's just him. He's by himself. He said he was shot. Was he actually shot? Yes. He was actually shot. Okay, Mm -hmm. so he did have an injury. It was, he was actually shot. Okay. It was a minor injury, but he did have an injury behind his This is bizarre. Very bizarre. James was interviewed. And on September 12th, Port St. Lucie and Savannah police announced that they linked James Brown to the murders of his wife and his children. Well, he's definitely acting so bizarrely. I I can't imagine he isn't. Very strange. So James told police that he had shot Carolyn while she was in bed in their home. And baby Brandon, two-year-old Brandon, was sleeping next to her. Oh. He said he smothered Brandon with a pillow. He said he put their bodies in a field in Palm Beach County, Florida. Now, this area where he said he put their bodies was extensively searched and there was no evidence of Carolyn or Brandon ever having been placed where he said that they were. Okay. James said that after killing Carolyn and Brandon, around July 17th, he drove Shakita and Barry to Brunswick, Georgia, where he shot Barry in the head and shot Shakita in the face and then disposed of their bodies somewhere along Interstate 95. He said, What is happening right now? I don't know. I, I can't even, like, we've talked about it before, but I can't even get into the mindset. There's just, it's just something I'll never understand. I'll never have appropriate words for. I just, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Uh, well, I don't know how you harm any children, especially your own children. But this is very bizarre. It's so weird. Now, he said that after doing this, he then shot himself in an attempt to complete suicide. However, we already know it was so minor that he only spent two days in the hospital. Yeah. So. So how committed was he? Doesn't seem that committed. Okay, so we already know that little Brandon and his wife were not found. What about the other two kids? Were they found? No. No. So the area that James described. So no remains have been found. He's saying that he had some kind of break i'm assuming he has some kind of an excuse but whatever it is he said he eliminated his family but we don't have any he placed them in two different places but we don't have any evidence right the area that james described along interstate 95 was searched and nothing was found there was also a lake near the brown family home that they dragged just to be on the safe side sure no bodies were found now james was able to produce a gun So he was able to tell them where they would find a gun, and they did. And I don't know that exact location, but he was able to say, and here's where you'll find a gun. And they found it. So there was some evidence of something? Well, we knew he had a gun. Yeah. He bought the gun. We found the receipt. But I, for me, I just think, okay, he's not totally unaware of what's around him because he's able to take them to a gun. But then when he says, and here's where you'll find these four bodies, they're not there. So do you think he's... Do you think he's lying about their locations? I I don't, to be honest with this case, I really don't know what to think. So I do think that a field in West Palm Beach is pretty vague. Okay, fair. 
And I think somewhere along the Interstate 95, somewhere in Georgia, where he doesn't even live, is also pretty vague and huge and vast. Is it possible that he didn't know exactly where he put them? I think that's possible. Is it possible that he didn't kill them at all and he didn't put their bodies anywhere? I mean, maybe. I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I think anything is possible, to be honest. Yeah, because he's admitted to the murders. So it's not like he's trying to misguide them or send police in a different direction. He's saying, oh, I absolutely killed them. And supposedly he's giving a location. Correct. Okay. Now, I will tell you this. I found in one publication, and I could not verify it, but in one publication, I read that he then later recanted these confessions. But I found that in one publication, and that's literally all it said. And so, like, I can't even, I don't even really know what that means. Yeah. But I just want to put it out there. Just that he did admit, but then, I don't know, maybe possibly recanted? Possibly. Maybe. I don't know. So weird. Okay, tell me more about this weirdo. All right. (laughs) James Brown was obviously immediately arrested and charged, but not with murder. He was charged with filing a false report because he'd originally told the police that, you know, that gunshot was from an attempted robbery, when in reality it was self-inflicted. Okay. So in September 1985, Florida state attorneys filed a warrant for James' arrest for the murders of Carolyn and Brandon because Carolyn and Brandon allegedly died in Florida. So he's been arrested and charged with the filing a false report in Georgia. That's where he is. Okay. And in Florida... Florida State is saying, okay, we're going to charge you with the murder of these two, Carolyn and Brandon. Gotcha. Gotcha. But James was not extradited to Florida until after he finished serving his time in Georgia for filing the false police report. What what kind of sentence did he get for that? So I don't know exactly how long the sentence was, but he was not brought back to Florida. He was not brought back to Florida until April of 1986. So from September 85 to... so. Yeah, so it took whatever, eight months or so to complete whatever it is he had to complete in Georgia. You got it. Now, once back in Florida, court-appointed doctors evaluated James and determined that he was able to stand trial. So on June 19th, 1986, James Brown was indicted by a grand jury for the murders of Carolyn and Brandon Brown. James' attorney filed a notice that James suffered from schizophrenia and was clinically insane when he allegedly committed the murders. A psychologist, Dr. Rifkin, filed a report that said that though James was probably insane when he committed the murders, he was able to assist in his defense. So he was able to stand trial, according to this doctor. But again, the doctor did make it very clear that he was probably insane at the time of the murders. So that's interesting. Does this mean he's on medication now? Well, now he is in jail. Right. But but no, at the time he was not. Right. But I'm saying now, meaning at the time of the trial. So as in when he was serving time in Georgia, did they maybe start managing his mental health there? So he was more capable of assisting in his defense because he was medicated, whereas when the crimes actually happened, he was not. So that's a good question. I they didn't give a reason like yes the med i do know that he would was make medicated sense, right i do know he was medicated while he was incarcerated okay and the medications did help with all of the different issues he was having okay so maybe that is the why because i was confused as to why how a doctor can say yeah he was insane at the time of the murder but yet he's also fit maybe to stand just, trial and maybe, maybe that is the why being managed by medication sure now but i guess i don't really understand the premise like If you were insane at the time, though, wouldn't that disqualify you from being able to be on trial? Exactly. That's like, I get it. You can aid in your own defense now, but you don't even know what you were doing then because you were insane. Right. So I don't know. That's why I brought it up. I I feel like I need to look more into that. I know. It was interesting. James told Dr. Rifkin that he had felt an urge to die and to take his people with him. He didn't think he was any good to them. He couldn't help them and he couldn't do enough for them. He said on the morning of the murders, James went to the living room and he said he wasn't thinking about anything, but then the thought of just ending it came to him. He picked up a gun, went into the bedroom and killed Carolyn and Brandon. James told the doctor that though she didn't say so, Carolyn wanted him to kill her. 
He said she wanted to die because they both had a venereal disease that was uncurable. He said that they both had sores and odors and that they'd both gone to see doctors about this issue, but they couldn't get rid of the symptoms and neither one of them could take it anymore. He went on to say that he'd inflicted his family with syphilis. And for what it's worth, there is no evidence that he actually had syphilis. Well, I was going to say syphilis can make you go insane, too. OK, so the pla- talk to me about. This. Yeah, so it can. From what I know about syphilis, and it's not much, um, it syphilis back in the day, if yeah. left untreated, could cause you to go, you ins- go yeah. insane. Yes. It affects your brain. By the 80s, I think we knew more about syphilis and we were able to treat. And he's saying he went to the doctor. And I don't have his medical records, but he's saying he went to the doctor to get treatment and whatever they did didn't help. But if he was being treated, then... Well, it's true. I mean, you only go insane from syphilis if you are untreated. Right. Which he's saying he was treated. But uh, but again, you're saying there's no evidence that either no of evidence, them had but again, a venereal disease. I don't have his medical records. But yeah, so I don't also, know what that means. I don't know. I don't know if uh, his wife is on board with this, though. Don't know if I'm quite uh, picking up what he's putting down there. I Me mean, neither. But I'm saying if if. Could that have been something that led him to to do this? If he did, in fact, have syphilis, then I don't think it can be ruled out. If it was left untreated, maybe. I mean, I wow. to me, there is no question that he's insane. Oh. To me, there is no question whether he killed his family or just admitted to killing his family when he really didn't kill his family. That's to true. Me, there's what, no if something else, what if she just ran away with the kids because she found he was being insane and he imagined that he killed them? For me personally, I don't think that can be ruled out. To me, that's not probable. But it to me, it is. I mean, the blood possible. on the walls is concerning. But we also know that he, let's be honest. We shot himself. His kids. And beats his kids. And so he beats like, his kids. Okay, that's fair too. It's a violent home. So yeah. with their, I mean, blood on the walls is pretty violent, but is it possible that he, there's blood on the walls and but he Yeah, didn't? he could have just imagined killing them and she's in some, she's hiding somewhere. Could be. With the kids. <gasps> hiding from him. This case is crazy. It's crazy. That's why we're covering it. It's unsolved. It's, even though there's a confession, it's unsolved. James went on to say that after shooting Carolyn... Shakita and Barry came into the bedroom and asked him what the noise was. And he told them that the the TV had exploded. James said that at the time of the murders, he'd been suffering from auditory and visual hallucinations and that these continued until after he was arrested and put on medication. Okay. Dr. Rifkin reported that James had been seriously disturbed for a long time, but had avoided detection and was able to fake appropriate expressions and social situations. And though James Brown had earned a master's degree, he scored low on an IQ test. Is this somehow mm-hmm. saying he's sociopathic or he is possibly even on the spectrum and doesn't understand some social cues? I don't know. That's how I interpreted it. But yeah, I think I'm just trying to go further into exploring mental health. He was diagnosed schizophrenic. He possibly had some kind of maybe venereal disease affecting his mental health. And then we have some other things, which means he doesn't understand, you know, uh, social cues as well, but has learned to fake it. Ah, Wow. But yet is able to earn a master's degree, which is not easy. No, that's true. While at the same time having a low IQ, or at least according to this test. And again, he thinks he killed them, but did he really? (laughs) I know. Wild. That isn't it wild? Because they've never been found. Let me just reiterate, they've never been found. By the end of 1986, three different psychiatrists had determined that James Brown was insane at the time he allegedly killed his family. So everybody's on board. This guy's insane. Yeah. So now it leaves us to what happened to his family. Did he really do it or did he imagine he did it? Right. Which is bonkers. Now, I will say James has a, a history of abuse. Sure. Mental health issues. Sure. So his father had spent eight years in the Florida State Mental Hospital after trying to injure his wife. Okay. James's paternal grandmother suffered from mental illness, and James's brother was incarcerated for shooting his wife. So, wow. Okay, a a lot of history of mental illness and abuse. Violence. Violence. Absolutely. Wow. And when James began taking the medications while in jail, the delusion stopped. Yeah. 
I mean, well, I mean, that does that certainly does happen when yeah. you're being treated for, you know, the mental health issue that you're having, the psychotic break that you're having. But that doesn't help you recover memories. So my oh, wild. Get this. On November 20th, 1986, James Brown was sentenced to an indefinite term of confinement in the Florida State Hospital. He pleaded innocent by reason of insanity to murder charges for Carolyn and Brandon Brown. He spent nine years in the Florida State Hospital. But in 1995, hospital officials determined that he'd recovered enough to be released to a halfway house where he lived for 19 months. At the end of that period, a judge determined James could be released to live with his sister in Tallahassee, despite the fact that he had just been arrested the week before during a dispute at the halfway house. Oh, boy. Now, as part of his release, James would be required to take medication and daily therapy. Officials at the halfway house wrote the court recommending that though they definitely wanted James moved out of their, you know, jurisdiction, they were uncomfortable with his plan to go live with his sister because they were not convinced he'd fully recovered. And if I was his sister, I would be very concerned about this man coming to live with me. Me too. Me too. James Brown told the court that he understood his mental condition and that he knew how to recognize the symptoms of a relapse. He said, as long as I get plenty of sleep at night, I'll be okay. So I I feel like this is always the double-edged sword with mental illness. And I'm speaking as somebody who has some knowledge of it. It, It's hard for someone who is in the throes of a mental break to acknowledge that you're in a mental break. It's very hard. Spotting it in somebody else is a lot easier than spotting it in yourself. So if your brain is malfunctioning, it's very hard to realize that your own brain is malfunctioning. That makes sense. There's folks that have mental health issues and then there's folks with mental health issues that become violent. Right. Violence. This is really scary. If you can't trust your life partner, if you can't trust your father, if you can't trust these people who like it's their job, it's my parents. They've committed to caring for you. Yeah. Like I can't imagine not feeling safe around my own parents. It's just there's nothing scarier to me than like this person who I don't know, their whole existence is to take care of you. And they are going to murder you. I mean, that's just terrifying. Yeah. James ended up being released. And for several years, he was able to stay out of trouble. However, in 2005, James found himself back in prison after threatening to kill a bank clerk during a robbery. And he must fully believe that he killed them because you notice he didn't get out and say, I'm going to start searching for them. I'm going to, you know, maybe she, maybe I thought that I was killing them, but she drove away. Yeah. Like he didn't start. He fully believes he killed them. Now, granted. Yeah. So many doctors have said he was insane at the time. Right. But he definitely thinks he did it. Right. Yeah. It appears that way to me. Wow. Carolyn, Shakita, Brandon, and Barry have never been found. Wow. It's going on 40 years. Wow. Since they disappeared. No trace of any of them. And James is in jail. Back in jail, yes, after um, threatening to kill the bank clerk. But he was out for several years. And wild. Here's the real kicker to me. And it makes me so sad. Oh, it makes me so sad because I feel like there's no justice. Georgia authorities never charged James with the murders of Shakita and Barry Brown. Now, again, maybe it makes me sad. And at the same time, I don't know, maybe he didn't do it. So maybe it's fair. But like these two children are missing. There's so lack of evidence of anything. I know. I just feel like... These poor two you want some, Yeah, you want someone to be punished. You want justice. Yeah. But I do agree. I don't know how they would charge him yeah. with it. As much as I agree, someone should be held responsible. I mean, he did admit to it, but then... He did. And again, but maybe he did it back in Florida. Yeah. You well, know you what know, I'm he saying? He admitted in Georgia. He admitted in Georgia. I know, but, but maybe he was confused. Maybe oh, okay, he really was back in maybe Florida. Maybe him. In, oh, yeah. And then dumped them in Georgia. So there's, yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it's like. Red tape. and You're caught in these weird gray areas. Yeah. And again, no bodies. No bodies. No bodies at all. Maybe he sold them to somebody. Who oh, knows? Gosh. It's wild and well, horrible. It is. And that that's the big question. That's why we're covering this case. 
Did James kill his family? I don't know. I know the bodies were not where James said they would be. Yet he was able to tell them exactly where the gun was. Right. I and don't it's know. four bodies and none have ever been found. None have ever been found. I mean, we cannot ignore the fact no one's seen or heard from them in almost 40 years. Sure. I mean, and it's an Occam's razor situation. Mm-hmm. The least complicated explanation is probably the most likely. Right. But then again, you raised a good point. If you have an abusive husband at home who you're afraid of, would you disappear to yeah. get away from him? Yeah. And I mean, I'm I just going to move valid. to another country. That's very valid to me. And maybe he just imagined that or he had intended to kill them and she somehow got them out. Right. Which I mean, I would like to think that happened. Oh, I hope I find that probably not extremely likely. But I mean, the thought of annihilating your family like this is just so unfathomable to me. I would like to think that she escaped. Me too. Me too. Oh, I would let, I, I, let because let me tell you, these three kids are like three of the cutest kids too. Aww. I mean, I was just like, oh my gosh, the fact that somebody could hurt these babies, they are so yeah. cute. Ideally, we're going to find out some answers as to what happened to this this family. Gosh, so, I hope so. Me too. Anyone with information about this case is urged to contact the Florida Department of Law Enforcement at 888-356-4774 or the Port St. Lucie Police Department at 772-871-5001 or their local authorities. The agency case number is 850-8339. Well, this is one of our Branch of Hope cases for 2024. Ooh, I love it. She's like, Branch of Hope, please bring me Branch of Hope. I can't with I the know. sad stuff anymore. I know. Well, I'm going to, it's going to get bad again because I'm going to tell you some statistics about domestic violence. Okay. Well, you know what? We're doing this for a good cause. We are. Because the charity that we're going to be donating to, you know, in relation to this case is a domestic violence center. But Before I talk about them, I just wanted to share a few statistics about domestic violence with you because hopefully you've never been a victim of domestic violence, but I can tell you, unfortunately, this type of abuse is prevalent and it's often hidden. Yeah. So an average of 24 people per minute, per minute, are victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner in the United States. Whoa. That's more than 12 million women and men over the course of a single year abused by intimate partners. That's tragic. Nearly three in 10 women and one in 10 men in the U.S. have experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by a partner and reported it having a related impact on their functioning. Over one in three women and one in four men in the U.S. have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Almost half of all women and men in the U.S. have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Women ages 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 generally experience the highest rates of intimate partner violence. And from 1994 to 2010, approximately four in five victims of intimate partner violence were female. And then, of course, like in a case with the Browns, you also have the children. Yeah. So, you know, if mom's being abused, she's still got these kids she's got to take care of. And, and Absolutely. So the Branch of Hope recipient for this episode is Safe Space. Safe Space has provided close to 500,000 safe nights of shelter to more than 40,000 domestic violence victims and children on the Treasure Coast. Safe Space is a state-certified domestic violence center that provides refuge from physical and emotional abuse throughout the Treasure Coast, including Indian River, Martin, and St. Lucie counties in Florida. It empowers victims to become survivors by providing an extensive array of other programs and services, including legal assistance, financial literacy training, emotional and mental health counseling, advocacy, community outreach, and prevention education. So if you would like your portion of proceeds to go to safe space, you can indicate that on one of our online polls or send us an email. Yeah, it sounds like this organization really could have helped, could have helped and will continue to help families just like the Brown family. Absolutely. And had they been involved earlier, maybe we wouldn't be covering this case. Right. Because as a mother, 
if I had to flee my home with yeah. my children, I mean, I'm very blessed. I have family. I have a support system. But I don't know what I would do if I didn't. It's a scary thought. Right. Because that mother bear comes out. But if you have very limited resources, very difficult. Yeah, really sad. So I'm I'm with you. I'm hoping for I'm hoping they're out there. I'm hoping they escape this violence and are out there well, living life and loving it. Yeah. And through uh, Branch of Hope and spreading awareness, we we hope to do our very small part and and helping to eliminate some of this domestic violence and help people in domestic violence situations. All right, guys. Well, if you loved this episode, love us or love the Branch of Hope and then the people we help through the Branch of Hope, please tell somebody. Word of mouth is the best way to get the word about our podcast and spread our mission, our new and improved mission, if you will. We're doing a lot of good work here and we really want you to spread the good word. Uh, You can join our Patreon also, which will allow us to keep creating and connecting with you. Also, a portion of your Patreon funds go directly to one of these nonprofit organizations every month. Please send us an email at thedarkoakpodcast at gmail.com. We are open to your questions, comments, and anything else you want to share. And for other ways to connect, hop over to thedarkoak.com. Be sure to follow us to our next episode where Stephanie tells us all about the lost colony of Roanoke. <laughs> I am so excited for that. You know, a historic, uh, I almost said a hysterical mystery. Not a hysterical mystery, a historical mystery. Um, actually, a hysterical mystery. I'd take that, too. Yeah. How about a hysterical historical mystery? Love it. <laughs> Love it. That's not what Roanoke is, but I'm going to work on that for a future yeah. episode. Yeah. We'll find it. We'll find it. I know we will. You guys, thank you so, so much for listening. Uh, we love you, Shiver Seekers. You guys rock. Have a good one. Bye. This episode of The Dark Oak was created, researched, written, recorded, hosted, edited, published, and marketed by Cynthia and Stephanie of Just Us Gals Productions and made possible by you, our shiver-seeking listener. Special thanks goes to Justice Himes for our incredible artwork and Ryan Crete for our amazing music.